Hello, welcome back. This is episode 6 of the Bandit Fiction Podcast. A whole half year of us bringing the best and brightest of emerging writers to life. Here's to six more, right? If you don't know what I'm talking about, allow me to introduce us. Bandit is a not-for-profit digital publisher focused on new and emerging writers, although anyone is welcome to submit. If you'd like to read what we've published or submit something of your own, check us out at www.banditfiction.com. The three stories we'll be reading today are The Word for Salt by Cathy Brown, Beyond La Morna by D.G. Chumpkin, and On the Run by Vijay Callahan. Before we get into them, though, we must give a shout out to our readers, listeners, community, and especially our patrons, David Brown, Stephen Thompson, Jake McAuliffe, Ola Ismail, Ryan Wall-Raven, Joe Butler, Zach Copeland-Green, Kevin Bonfield, and Randy Workman. If you'd like to find out how to become a patron, with special perks including exclusive discounts and being able to nominate stories for this very podcast, just head over to www.banditfiction.com forward slash support. Our first reading of this episode is The Word for Salt by Kathy Brown. Read by Kathy Brown. Helen and I were due to be born on the same day. She was two weeks early, I was two weeks late, and that month was the longest time we ever spent apart until she left for the University of Birmingham. Then we spent six weeks apart, and then she got sick. We were more like twins than cousins, so when Mum made noises about heading home on that last Saturday night, I said, not yet. The other girls followed my lead and begged to stay a little longer. And that's when Nurse Ellis shot us all and said that we could stay the night. She unlocked the games room for us. A peach curtained lounge packed with tired furniture and frilly table lamps. We were momentarily silenced. Two hours ago, hospital nurses glared at us for cluttering up the corridor. But here, at the hospice, nurses were opening doors to make room for us. Aunt Janet brushed aside our parents' niggles. Of course Helen would want us there. Whilst our mums ferried back and forth to fetch our things, Sarah and I did a Tesco run for snacks. We transformed the games room into one of our old sleepover nests, a coffee table full of junk food and Coke cans the air liberally scented with deodorant and dry shampoo. With sleeping bags, we claimed our beds. Sarah and Gemma moved the quickest and got the two sofas. Nick and I had to make do with the lounge chairs, pulling the levers back and pressing our bodies back to flatten them. We raided the sideboard for games and cards to fill the long hours. We laughed lots, and when one of us cried, the rest didn't comment. We'd cried so often together that tears had become as mundane as coughs. They came and went, and meant little. We took it in turns to sit with Helen. Helen's room fuzzed into focus as my eyes adjusted to the painfully bright lights. A water glass on a bedside table, a monitor whirring gently on top of the trolley. Aunt Janet sitting in position, Helen, lying in a propped-up hospital bed, her breaths ragged and rasping, and an empty chair waiting for the next century. I squeezed her hand, waiting for her fingers to twitch back, but they remained limp. There was one clip on the end of her finger, but no other wires and tubes. They had stopped giving her anything except pain relief. They weren't even giving her water or liquid food any more. How could she stand a chance without water? Her lips were chapped. I wanted to dip my finger in the water glass and rub it along them, shaking droplets into her mouth. But Aunt Janet was smiling at me, so I, I did nothing. Hey, sweetie, I said. It's April. I'm right here, okay? I love you very much. 
I had chanted this greeting a thousand times before. In the days after surgery, I whispered into her induced sleep, coaxing her to come back. And it had worked. First, her eyes opened and blinked at my questions. Then, when they took the tube out of her throat, she croaked, Higher, with a tired but familiar grin. The doctors did their work. The physiotherapist strengthened her with daily exercises. And I cast my secret magic. I filled a little notebook with every scripture I could find that promised healing. God is within her. She will not fall. Psalm 46 verse 5. I wrote her name in the margins of my class notes. I bought her Christmas present in May and hid it under my bed. I told God that she must live and felt that he agreed. My prayers were answered slowly. It took weeks for her to be discharged. She came home weak and in a state of placid confusion. The girls and I took her out every Saturday to cafes where there were no steps for her to climb. It became our weekly ritual, and with every week we saw how more and more of her was coming back to us. Although there were setbacks. One lunch she asked Gemma for a fork, and got mad when Gemma handed her one. No, a fork! She kept saying over and over as we piled up every utensil on the table in front of her like a shabby tribute. I finally realised that what she wanted was salt. I passed the little pink sachet and she accepted it, rolling her eyes with exasperated affection. We all laughed and Helen had beamed. But Sarah fretted afterwards, saying that it wasn't right that Helen, who could recite the whole of the periodic table, should forget the word for salt. I had to remind Sarah that this was all a completely normal part of recovery. Helen's brain just had to reform the broken connections. She'd get there in time. The next Thursday, she collapsed again. I sat squeezing her hand, waiting for a reply, whilst Aunt Janet talked about King David's baby the one that didn't get better. And David said to his servants, Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. You should add that verse to your promise book. It will help, she said. I nodded and smiled, but didn't write it down. Helen's rasps punctuated the spaces between Aunt Janet's words. Nick came for her shift, and before I headed to my lounge chair bed, I kissed Helen's cheek and checked her scalp for new hair growth. They said that her hair would grow back brown after chemo, but they underestimated her. The soft fuzz growing in was her trademark platinum halo, and it did look a little longer than last week. Come back, I commanded silently. In the morning, James arrived, in clothes crumpled from the two-hour drive from Birmingham. Aunt Janet wrapped him in her arms and he cried. She shushed him and said it was very good of him to come. I didn't mind, James, but I didn't fawn over him the way everybody else did. Last month, he had broken up with Helen. I couldn't blame him. They'd only met at Freshers Week, and Helen couldn't go back to uni. She was sad about the breakup at first, and then forgot it had happened. He was seeing someone else now, but he still replied to her messages and called her weekly. For this, he was lauded a saint. Aunt Janet took him to Helen's room. He lasted less than five minutes before dashing out to the car park and throwing up in the bushes. More people arrived. Our parents, grandparents half the church, and when the hospice grew too crowded, we slipped away to KFC, taking James with us because Nick said he looked lost. I wasn't sure that was a good idea, because of the whole vomiting thing, but he was eager to come and said that food would do him good. We ordered chicken burgers and sat by the window, staring in dumb wonder 
at people walking past enjoying an ordinary Sunday afternoon. I swamped my chips and salt and tasted nothing. My phone rang. It was Mum. Helen died without me. The hospice was a sweltering press of people. They looked up as we walked in. Did they know that we had been at KFC when she died? The air droned with sympathetic voices. I ducked beneath the outstretched arms of hugging relatives until I found Aunt Janet. She sent us through in groups of three. James, Gemma and I filed into Helen's room. Gemma and I sat down. James lingered by the window, his gangly frame casting a shadow on the bed. The trolley, monitor and water glass had disappeared. There was only Helen. I scrutinised her face to see what had changed since last night. The rasping breathing had stopped, but otherwise she looked the same. I squeezed her hand. If it was cold, I couldn't tell. The room was warm. Gemma bowed her head as if she were praying. The book of promises dug into my leg through my jeans pocket. What if I gently pushed open her eyelids and blew into her eyes? A mad thought. But, with a new sense of certainty, I knew that if I did, Helen would gasp in shock and wake up. I pictured Aunt Janet's grey face breaking into raptured joy. I glanced at James, but he was staring at his feet. I slowly rose and leaned over. Trembling, I reached for Helen's eyes. But as I did so, I saw her lips. They were red, raw canyons of cracks. The slightest friction would burst them open. She'd had nothing to drink for three days and the water glass was gone. I could bring her back, I knew it. But this time she wouldn't wake with a grin. She'd wake retching, her tongue dried out and her brain starved of oxygen. She'd wake without knowing the word for salt, maybe without knowing any words at all. I could bring her back, but not all the way back. Just enough to force her to relive the moment of death all over again, this time without the steady drip of morphine. Gemma was staring at me. I'd frozen, half bent over the bed, my hand hovered in midair. I forced myself to move. I cupped Helen's face and kissed her forehead, as if that was what I had meant to do all along. We can give you a minute alone with her if you like, I said to James, no longer caring if he got special boyfriend privileges. Gemma nodded, already pushing her chair back, the legs scraping across the floor. He shook his head in mild panic, but good manners left him no choice. Okay, he whispered hoarsely. Thanks. I closed the door behind us slowly, as if not to disturb his goodbye. James remained pressed to the window, staring at his feet, until I closed the door all the way shut. Next up is Beyond La Morna, written and read by D.G. Chumpkin. 1970. Seven weeks to the day since Sidney Quick went silent, his son walked the coast path on autopilot as he'd done almost every day since his mum died. Soldier's buttons, Robin noted the spiky blooms of cornflower blue underfoot as he trod his familiar, solitary track out of New Lynn Harbour. The cliffside above Mausol, the next village along, was raucous with heather, sweet-scented bells ringing silent and glowing in the early evening sun, a sun that showcases a unique shine in this small corner of Cornwall. The surrounding sky was burnt orange, a stain that would soon blossom into lilac. Blue skies were rare in this part of the world and time of day, signalling when they did appear, a good day ending. Sitting in the deafening silence of their house was not an option with his dad still mute and his mum's usual music reduced to just an echo, so Robin set off each day to walk for hours at a time. 
He plated up a steak and kidney pudding for Sydney before packing up another for himself, now quickly thickening with fat upon its allegedly greaseproof wrappings. He planned to eat it alone, looking out to the sea, untroubled for just a moment by the otherwise constant reminders that his mum was dead, that their lives may as well be over too. He'd left Sydney, sat at their scrubbed kitchen table, silent and staring into the belly of their stove, from which on that day he'd removed Bessie's favourite cake tin, contents aflame, with bare hands and without a sound, the pain of his blistering palms, no match for the agony of his shattered heart. An invisible skylark whistled a relentless solo above him as Robin pounded his path. He'd long since learned not to look up, for it was only to be heard, not seen. Its wings would flutter in a rhythm that melted into the air around it, creating a haze to hide in. Campions, with bright pink petals inexplicably named red, or else white with a bladder-like seedling on the back, baked dry by the sun. Foxgloves, tall, bell-shaped, open only at the top and favoured by the fat bees that disappeared inside them. Sally Meansoms, the satin sheen of their daisy-like purple blades, shimmered as they began to close up for the evening. Robin named the flowers that appeared on his route as his mum had routinely done. He heard the briskness of her tone, and he echoed the names she taught him, experiencing his latest surge of guilt, this time for having given up the practice too young. Too many walks they'd now never have. Too much time lost too soon. Don't think about that. He resumed his identification of the blooms, kidney vetch, thrift and squill. Unlike his fisherman fathers, Robin's skin hadn't been accustomed to the outdoors, but its daily exposure to the hottest month of the year had already left it thickened and sun-spotted, each burnt layer long since peeled and replaced by a darker, more robust one. It was the closest to tanned Robin had ever been, and the shine of his sad blue eyes was enhanced by it. The saltiness suited him. In an attempt to even out the harsh lines left on his body by his white Wrangler vest, he'd removed it, allowing it to hang limply from the waistband of his sports shorts, reflective blue nylon edged with lemon piping. Clothes shopping in and around New Lynn wasn't up to much, so he'd bought these on his first trip to a big city, his first shift as a conductor on the trains, having left behind the ticket office soon after that day. The menswear assistant who'd served him at the department store suggested he try them on first. Robin had declined avoiding his eye and dashing for the door purchases close to his chest, back to the train station. He'd not been up for much conversation for a while, although hadn't quite been reduced to the reticence of Sydney. The chaos in which Robin's father usually existed had also been extinguished in the same moment as Bessie. Robin imagined Sydney, conspicuous by his absence, as the subject of much chatter at the Swordfish Inn and guilty gossip in the harbour for weeks that followed. He'd even heard people of New Lynn recounting the tale in hushed whispers as he passed, claiming that Sydney had not made a sound since his blood-chilling howl of despair that could be heard as high as Paul, another village that overlooked their port, hosted their dearly departed in its cemetery. Robin had been spared the sight of his mother's body, broken in the road upon which she'd been blasted by a speeding Ford Zephyr, Blue, later found abandoned at Penzance train station, from where Robin had just come, from work, back home. Robin knew to where he was headed, a small stone outcrop beyond Lamorna that he didn't know the name of, only occasionally inhabited by others and not easily stumbled upon. This time of the evening suited him. Dog walkers would be done for the day, and any school kids were still in term and therefore proper bedtime routine. He'd have it to himself. He arrived, unaffected by the walk, though it had taken an hour and a half, no longer breathless at the steep inclines and jagged edges of the coast path after several weeks of treading them on pointed toe to ease the pressure on his leg muscles. They'd grown accustomed to the shape of the path just as he had, reshaping themselves accordingly, the arch of his feet not adequately supported by his usual choice of daps. His face, freckled and big-chinned, was lightly sprayed by the salt water from playful waves of aquamarine that slapped the largest, flattest rocks right on the shoreline. Robin breathed his relief deep into his chest, filling the cavity with that now familiar sense of freshness. He positioned himself under the cliff face, overlooking a rock pool that received intermittent swirling jets from the sea in a rhythm that Robin habitually matched his breathing to. He meditated without knowing it, resting, allowing his thoughts to take instruction from the hush of the distant horizon, the sun still high above it, threatening to drop. This was the moment he'd survived so many days for, he sought it daily, and it never lasted, but he always hoped it would. 
He felt out the smoothness of the rock he sat upon with flat palms of his outstretched hands. He closed his eyes to capture and trap the moment behind them. After a spell, a shadow was cast over the slowly descending sun. Robin sensed it from behind his closed eyes, wondering with annoyance from where the culprit cloud had come. The distant roaring of the sea negated any silence, but the remaining stillness was broken by a low, oh hello, that caused Robin's eyes to snap open and his breath to catch in his chest its rhythm broken. Didn't mean to startle you, came the rumbling voice of a man, now wandering into Robin's view, standing over the pool that had lost half its contents since he'd arrived. The tide was turning. Robin mustered a greeting, taken aback by the sudden appearance of a stranger in his solitary space. You the quick boy, the stranger said. His dark eyes absorbed the reflection of Robin's blue, seen you down here a few times. Oh, yeah, I have. I mean, I am. Robin's vision was growing accustomed to the now dusky light, a glistening sky of amethyst. That had come quickly, had he fallen asleep? The man, familiar but hard to place, continued to look, and Robin realised that he was shivering gently from a mild chill in the air. He hurriedly slipped his creased vest back over his shoulders where it clung damp and tight. I live up there, the man gestured indistinctly back in the direction of Lamorna, just out for a walk like. Robin smiled politely, unsure how to process this disturbance to his usual routine, but didn't answer. The man returned the smile and took a seat alongside Robin on the rock, holding out an enormous, nicotine-stained hand. Sims! Robin slipped his own hand, half the size, into it, noticing the calluses upon his palm. I've seen you at the fish market. I'm Robin. What's on, Robin? Good to know you, he replied through thick, cracked lips and unusually straight teeth. Sounds about right. I've worked down there. He looked out to the horizon while Robin's eyes flicked down instinctively. The yellow hue of Sim's skin glowed over the grey rock beneath it while his rough hand worried the flush surface. You know my dad? Robin asked automatically, not really wanting to know. Sim's eyes returned to Robin's who coughed through a haze of timely sea mist, inhaling the smoke and salt embedded in the denim dungarees that Sims wore over a long-sleeved t-shirt of moss green. I know of him, Sims said, but everyone knows of Sydney Quick. That was a real sad thing that happened, I'm sorry. Robin's stomach fell an inch or so. He acknowledged the sorry with a nod of his head before turning and looking out toward the point on the horizon at which purple gave way to a layer of rust and then the blue beneath, his own image mirrored. The retreating sunshine danced seductively on the sea's surface, twinkling a thousand wise eyes. Why is everyone sorry? Neither spoke for a minute or so. Robin noticed that Sims too was breathing deeply, also in time with the ins and outs of the ocean in front of them, the learned habit of his trade perhaps. An alien beeping pierced the quiet. Sims stared his confusion down towards the boulder upon which they sat, where Robin's hand had also rested. Robin reached down to silence the new wristwatch he'd bought along with his sports shorts, Casio Digital Silver. It flashed 8pm, a sensible time to start the walk home before the sun fell off the end of the earth. Fumbling to switch off the sound, he pulled out several sun-bleached arm hairs caught in the strap's links, flushing with the embarrassment of it, which Sims either didn't notice or politely pretended not to, looking out once again. Robin reviewed the man's profile, strong, wide-nosed and unshaven, bearded like Sydney. Not quite in Sydney's more senior years, but he was certainly older than Robin. His skin was tanned in a way that Robin's never could be, while Sims was rich in tone, his deep brown bush of hair and wiry beard only gently speckled with grey. It can't have been easy, Sims said, breaking the interminable silence. He turned to face Robin fully, his broad torso following his head a moment later. Robin felt the large and blistered hand land upon his shoulder and found that he didn't mind, that it was comfortable. No, it's not. I mean... It hasn't been. It hasn't been. Easy. I've been there. Robin's eyes asked how without words. My dad, the war, Sims explained. You're doing fine. He smiled a true smile. Straight teeth exposed and parted, eyes creased at the corners. It wasn't one of the sad, sympathetic smiles that had been offered to Robin endlessly since that day, and he returned it. You're 21, right? Robin nodded. He'd have guessed Sims was about 35, give or take a few years, but it didn't yet occur to him to wonder. 
Sims gently lifted his hand from Robin's shoulder, lowering it to his knee, exposed far below the piped edge of his shorts, as Sim turned further inwards on the rock and said through his throat, You'll get through this. You'll grow from this. Robin stared. He took a breath and believed it for the first time, imagining just for a moment a future in which his mum's absence was not felt so raw with each passing minute. A single tear welled in the corner of his big blue eye, rolling onto the end of his freckled nose from where Sims wiped it away with a yellow thumb and pulled Robin, softly, yet with the full strength of his working arms, into an embrace. Robin's breath froze in his chest as he tried to decipher the unfamiliar feeling. He'd never hugged a man who wasn't his dad and it had been a long time since that had happened. And this felt different. Sims held Robin with a closeness he'd never felt, never even considered. He relaxed into it, weeping gently, realising again that he didn't mind, that he was comfortable. The embrace lasted longer than Robin expected, not knowing what to expect. Their chests were pinned together, rising and falling. Robin's tears ceased in the cool breeze of the evening, suddenly warmer. He smelled brute under the sweat on the skin of Sim's neck, medicated shampoo in his hair and was still inhaling it deeply when the man pulled away. You okay? Sims no doubt spotted the fleeting disappointment that Robin felt cross his face upon being released. Robin looked back and nodded as instinct carried him closer still on the rock the butterflies in his stomach battling a churning storm. Understanding filled him, and he communicated this to the man through his eyes and his grip, reaching out to pull Sims's hand back to its former position on his knee, hoping, beyond hope, that he'd not misread the signs, that the longing was mutual. The firm flesh of Robin's thigh quickly became awash with goosebumps as Sims's hand brushed across its outer edge, backwards, to meet his other at the base of Robin's spine, just under the vest. His vast hands held Robin there with a tenderness that didn't match their size. Both men breathed their mutual relief heavily into one another's necks, returning to their embrace. What kind of Cornishman gets stuck on the coast path? Robin lunged over yet another formation of rocks in the shadow of the looming cliff, constant and solid. His daps were soaked by the pools and puddles he couldn't see in the darkness. He deviated from the path, heading back for fear of falling off it with no light to guide the way home, dominated as it was by huge heads of rock bowed to the ocean that opened out onto nothing. The descent back into La Morna was treacherous enough by day, but under the cloak of darkness it vibrated with risk. With the sea keeping a respectable distance, he tackled its cove from the rocky shoreline, just enough artificial light from the empty windows of surrounding cottages to keep him on track, but he needed to get back on the path. Under a sliver of moonlight he'd be fine once he got back as far as Mausel, but his usual return path would be unrecognisable in the absence of day. The closed blooms cloaking the path had bowed their heads to the darkness, the fragrance of heather extinguished by the descending sea mist. Robin's vest was torn under the arm, his shorts damp, and his breath broken by the effort it was taking to get home, by the late evening chill and by the euphoria of what had just happened. His mind raced with sensations now slipping away like seawater in his cupped palm. He touched a hand to his large chin bone, tracing a fingertip softly against the skin that had been rubbed raw by the bristle of Sims's beard. He ascended the cliffside back onto the coast path, panting, and remembered with a burst of longing the impression of Sims's cracked lips against his own. He felt again the instinctive arch of his own back against their rock as Sims had lowered the weight of his body onto Robin's, which unclenched in turn. Get a grip, he blurted out loud, into the empty space surrounding him, and get up this sodding cliff. Up on the coast path there was enough moonlight to offer a gloomy vision of a few feet ahead at a time, and the safety net of thickets and trees on either side. It was less of a path at this part, more of a jumble of rocks, scattered by the hand of a giant like the roll of a die. The sea breeze blew over the cliff top, chilling Robin, whose skin pimpled between its freckles. All birdsong had been silenced and he continued with caution, his brain working at quite the opposite pace. With each step taken, a new image surfaced. Fingering the tear in the underarm of his vest, he remembered snagging it on the sharp edge of the rock as he'd fought furiously to release Sims from his dungarees. Sims had chuckled and calmly lowered the straps before turning his attention to Robin's torn vest, peeling back the white cotton, transparent with sweat, exposing the shivering chest beneath. He planted a lingering kiss upon the scratch the rock had left on the skin under Robin's arm. Robin stopped, breathless, remembering the surge of rushing blood that repeated itself now. He'd felt more alive than he had in weeks, more excited than he had in his whole life. 
His excitement shone now as it did then in the moisture of the blue nylon caressing his thigh, reflecting the moonlight. In the cold light of Mausol, the tiny village and port that connected Newlyn to Paul, in whose cemetery Bessie was now buried, Robin experienced an echo of the heart he'd heard beating in Sims's chest, upon which he'd laid his heavy head. His own hammered against his ribs as a well of emotion forced itself upwards, thickening his throat. He caught sight of his reflection in the window of the ship inn as he passed it, doors closed and blank. It must have been past midnight, but Robin couldn't check, his watch shattered by a fall he'd taken after leaving the stone outcrop. Robin's mirror image was ashen and windswept. The air here was still. His eyes glowed in the stark reflection of the street light above, while his mind's eye reflected the image of the man he'd left on the rock, smiling serenely and silently as he hauled up his dungarees. Robin remembered those shoulders, the dip of his collarbone, the sweat that collected in it, and the expanse of curled hair decorating the barrel of a chest beneath. Stop! He gave an internal gasp of panic that pulled at his stomach from the inside. This is wrong. You're supposed to be grieving your dead mum. What would she think? What would his father say? Nothing. Robin remembered bitterly that Sydney had said nothing at all for seven weeks now. Guilt consumed Robin as he arrived back in New Lynn, and it occurred to him that to continue in this direction would be to retrace and reverse the steps he'd taken on that day. He'd been there. He'd arrived on the scene within minutes of Bessie taking her last breath. He must have seen it. The car that had ended her, he must have seen it. It would have driven right past him on its way out to where he himself had come from, and he'd missed it. Too distracted by the boys on the beach and the fucking flowers that lined the path. Robin arrived at the bottom of their terrace, greedily accepting the deep breaths that had been stolen from his mother in that very spot. He surveyed the empty scene, the tide behind his ocean eyes overflowing, washing away the events of the evening. He'd remember it differently. His arousal would give way to guilt, his excitement to shame. He'd bury that which had felt so right under a barrage of blame and demonise it. He'd reflect on an older man, husky and breathy with excitement and gratitude for being granted the permission to touch such a young, firm body. He'd flinch at the thought of hands thick, fumbling and dirty yellow that had grappled at him without caution, leaving marks upon his skin and his memory. He'd convince himself that the fisherman, a workmate of his father's, had been lying in wait for his arrival, ready to strike. His guilt and his grief would battle with, beat and overwhelm his gratitude to Sims for being his first, for being there, then. He'd forget. The lust and longing with which he'd held on to that man. The completeness he felt in that moment as each gasped the breath of the other. That Sidney was awake that night, awaiting the safe return of his son the newly healed skin of his once blistered palms pressed together as tightly as Robin's body had been against Sims. And that was Beyond La Morna, written and read by DG Champkin, and we have the man with us here now to discuss a little bit about himself and his work as a writer. So if you could introduce yourself, please. Uh, of course, yeah. Hi, I'm Danny. Um, on page is DG Champkin. I suppose I thought that initials were a little bit more interesting. Um, I'm based in the southwest of England, live in Bristol, spend a lot of time in Cornwall, but uh, I'm originally from the northeast. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, could you yeah. tell us a little bit about what inspired Beyond La Morna, what, what went into it, and what led to its creation? Yeah, it was, it was a very much a Cornish story, based on you know, the fact that when you arrive in Cornwall, something seems to happen that unlocks your creativity. Yeah, we were very fortunate, my partner and I, last year, that when um, lockdown started, the first one, we were already in Cornwall visiting my mother-in-law for Mother's Day. So when the lockdown was announced, we had a little discussion and said, perhaps we should just stay here because my partner was working from home. I was furloughed immediately. And it just made sense, really. Our, my in-laws were, you know, in the vulnerable category. We could look after them in terms of shopping and things. And, you know, for our own well-being, being in Cornwall seemed to be the right thing to do. And for me, we got out and about onto the coast path every single day and the muses sort of arrived and I found myself writing endlessly day after day, which is not something that had ever happened to me before. I'd always fancied myself as a writer, but it happened pretty organically and pretty quickly. So this story of um, Robin Quick kind of formed very quickly. And it's actually, it's a much larger story than Beyond the Morna, but for me, 
I wanted to experiment with the short story form. So I extracted a section of a larger piece of work to see if it would stand on its own. And, and hopefully it did. Yes, I'm inclined to agree that it has. Yeah, thank you, yeah. So, as you mentioned there, that it is part of a larger piece of work, assuming that means that you've sort of preempted my next question, which is, have you continued to work on it in the time since? I have, yes. I was, uh, you know, I was I was furloughed for quite a long time in the end, so I was working in the hospitality industry. So I was furloughed for a four-month period, and then I went back for a couple of months, and then I was furloughed for another four months. So for the second furlough, I thought, I really want to do this project i really want to get it on the page and turn it into something that i can be you know proud of that i've used my time well i've decided to be a writer essentially you know with this daily practice so i turned it into a novel called cuts the quick which i've since finished and and been through two rounds of editing on my own so that's as far as it's gone so far you know i've I've started sort of submitting it to agents for review and i've had some nice feedback which is encouraging but you know going back to work and it's rather disrupted my flow i think and i really need to give it my full attention again i find that a lot with a lot of authors i've spoken to recently that the whole readjusting to normal quotation marks life has interrupted the flow on a lot of people's work but it's finding that balance again and finding the time when you're not working to to write again which can be hard absolutely yeah i'm trying i'm trying now i'm trying to sort of um, apply more discipline to it i think when i was furloughed i had the luxury of sort of dipping into it whenever i liked but now i i have time in the morning where i i tend to write a few pages and then i allow time immediately after work during the week i mean at the moment i'm working on my wedding speech so i kind of have a time limit on that <laughs> <laughs> and then beyond that i'll go back into another creative writing project i think yes of course uh, there are more pressing issues at, at hand it seems yeah well yeah, I mean, you could say there's nothing more pressing than, than doing it, than doing the work that you love, because that's what I was lucky enough to discover last year. And I really, I miss the, the, the freedom that I had to do it. But at the same time, you know, I enjoy my work. We all have to work for a living and um, I'm going to make it work and I'm going to allow myself to do both. So uh, that's the plan. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a good plan. And, and if you can get into the rhythm of it, so to speak, it'll definitely serve you well. I mean, it's very much the same rhythm that I had before I was furloughed from my job as well. But it, it can be hard to find, and it definitely took me a while. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think, you know, the practice of being kind to yourself is really important because I would beat myself silly over, you know, you had time to do this and you didn't do it. And actually, you know, if, if I've forced it too hard, I'm not going to come up with something good. But at the same time, you have to have something on the page in order to turn up to the page next time. So I think allowing myself um a bad day is fine so long as i've arrived written something down something that i can work with later something that i can discard later even if i if if i don't agree with it anymore but yeah it has to be a much more disciplined process these days Mm -hmm. as uh someone once said to me which i'll I'll give the the pg version of rather than the the original version that was said to me is like you can't edit what you haven't written effectively Yes, so I think you can. You can. Yeah, <laughs> you can always edit something bad that you've written, but you can't edit something you didn't write in the first place. But yes, yeah, it is. It yeah. is definitely right. You do have to give your. You do have to be a little bit disciplined and be like, I have the time to write now. I will write. But equally, it's fine to be like, it's not happening today, and that that's okay. <laughs> and hitting that yeah, balance can yeah. be difficult sometimes. Yeah, it really can. It really can. I think going back to work as well and realizing how. <clears throat> excuse me how limited time was going to be it was easier to be unkind to yourself but actually the fact that i'm doing it is light years ahead of where i was 18 months ago so i'm I'm really pleased yes exactly any step in the right direction is yeah. well exactly that a step in the right direction yeah which leads me nicely into my next question is what did you change about beyond lamorna in creating it is it its own standalone thing it, well yes it did need a little bit of attention to mm-hmm. make it its own its own short story because there was some context that wouldn't have been in what is essentially a chapter in the novel chapter comes about a third of the way through the novel so there's been a lot of setup in terms of that character so i had to bring some of that in to kind of understand who robin quick is why he's kind of isolated in his own hometown and the distance between him and his father which is kind of explored at great length in the novel in the short story which is what i quite like about reading short stories writing them is obviously a much bigger challenge. So trying to fit all that into about 3,000 words or whatever your, your target is, is a challenge. So I had to change a fair bit 
for me, ultimately, I wanted it to be resonant, the kind of beautiful image. I wanted something that I could remember the Cornish Coast path from. So yes, it's about Robin. Yes, it's about his father. Yes, it's about Sims, who he meets on the path, and him exploring his own um, sexuality in private. But also, it's about the beauty of his surroundings and the fact that you know he has the freedom to explore them unspoiled, which is kind of where I was last year. I was very fortunate to be in Cornwall at a time when no one else was. <laughs> yeah, you know, and obviously, I understand why people flock to Cornwall now. I completely understand it. It's such a beautiful place for, for the people who are born, bred, live there day in day out. It's this beautiful territory that gets completely overwhelmed by people so I wanted to show a little bit of isolated Cornwall so I realize I've deviated from your question but in answer to it that part of the short story was relatively unchanged because that was very important to the chapter but I have to bookend it with some context and a kind of guided summary at the end almost it, it, it by no means tells you what's going to happen to Robin next it by no means tells you what's going to happen to Sydney next um, it allows the reader to draw their own conclusions and I suppose for me turning it from a longer form novel into a short story it was about being comfortable with that because I think as a new writer I'm inclined almost to overshare <laughs> and I'm still still learning the art of allowing the reader to draw their own conclusions so this was a great exercise in learning how to do that. Yes absolutely and I think that's something that I have noticed through reading and reviewing all of the short stories I've done for Bandit is Sometimes with short stories, 3,500 words or whatever our exact limit is, I can't recall off the top of my head, it's not enough to provide a full conclusion in a lot of cases, and you have to have those almost semi-open conclusions at the best of times to be able to fit a, a convincing ending that doesn't feel staccato, for want of a better phrase, like that it just ends. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think in this particular mm. story, it was just about Robin going home. That was enough, you know. I mean, it, it, we explore, you know, how he feels. He's, he's he's racked with guilt for, you know, thinking about sex when he should be thinking about his dead mother. He's racked with the secrecy of not t telling his father about his feelings. But when he gets home, there is an understanding that his father's been waiting for him and that there is love in that house. It's just a different kind. And I think that's probably enough to end it as a short story. I hope, anyway. Yeah, I, I agree. The ending works pretty well because the, the whole extract feels like what I think it was intended to, to come across as, which is more like just a slice of someone's life rather than, you know, their entire existence laid out on paper. It just comes across as a, as a well, as an extract. And yeah. I think that works yeah, fine yeah. because when it comes to the end, it, it doesn't feel like the end of Robin's story in a way. Like It feels like the end yes. of our journey with Robin, which I think is probably exactly what you intended. It is, and I'm glad, I'm glad it came off that way, you know. In in my head, Robin continues, you know, he, he now lives in a gorgeous house on the in, in Carvis Bay in Cornwall and looking over the beach with his with his now husband. We're talking fifty years after Beyond the Morna. Mm -hmm. But to me he's a very real person, but actually for anyone who's looking to dip into a short story, which I do myself, um, they don't they don't need that level of detail. They just need to know what happened that day. And I think uh, it was a good day for Robin. <laughs> Uh, so on to the next question, uh, which is, as someone yourself who's uh, had something published now and is working on a longer piece, we've already kind of touched on this, but what advice do you have for other aspiring authors, short stories or, or otherwise? Um, there's a couple of things, really. I think research is very, very important in terms of researching your craft. I had the freedom, as I said last year, to read a lot as well as write a lot. So I was reading two or three books at any one time, which I realise is a you know a luxury not afforded to most of us most of the time. But it meant that I was able to read books about writing, about creativity, as well as reading novels and short stories. So you just kind of learn the craft ongoing. And I think you're never going to write well if you don't read well. And just be prepared, I think, to learn constantly. So since I wrote Beyond Le Morno, I I went on a short course about short story writing with Curtis Brown Creative, which was brilliant. Six week course, which just kind of immersed you in the process to learn new techniques. And I think I look back fondly at Beyond La Morna, but I would I would do it differently now. And I think just giving yourself the kindness and the freedom to think like that is probably the best advice. Yeah. Yeah, well said. Uh, <laughs> and as our final note for the interview. Where else can we find your work? 
I have a website and an Instagram profile. And so dgchampion.com and at dgchampion on Instagram. Very heavily around reading at the moment because I, I don't have um, cut to the quick um, out there for the public to read, but I'm hoping that will come soon. Um, and there's another short story to follow, which is called Shades of Yellow, which is a, 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 a similar sort of coming of age queer story but set in my hometown of Sunderland. So it's a little bit more against a industrial mining backdrop. And so it's less about the beautiful coastline of Cornwall, more about some sort of gritty, similar to my own experience, actually, growing up in the 80s and 90s in that area. So that will be on my website too. Very good, very nice. Thank you for joining us, Danny. But I think we will draw it to a conclusion there. Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that was Danny Champkin speaking about Beyond La Morna. Our final piece for the day is On the Run by Fija Callahan, read by me. The rain washes the glowing amber lamplight into the streets. Rivers of it spill over broken bottles and cigarette butts and into the gutters. The dirty water jumps at my ankles like a hungry dog as I struggle to get away. I gotta find somewhere to lie low. Just for a little while. Just until I have a plan. I turn onto West Collins, where the amber light fades under pink and green and red neon. Red smears up against the curb, and the image of the body pushes its way back into my head. I struggle not to throw up. It's a diner, Sal's, where I used to go a lot before I was married. I still go every once in a while. It's tempting to walk in and pretend, just for a moment, that everything's all right it's too risky. They know me too well. Sal might even call my wife. Is she awake yet? She was finally asleep when I left, after a string of long night shifts at the hospital. She works so hard. The poor doll deserves so much better than me. Can't stop seeing the figure in my head. Over and over I hear the crack like a gunshot. I didn't know it would be so loud. I didn't know her head would come apart like that. Up ahead I see the dolly. Old timey letters emblazoned in red over the now showing board. They're playing how to marry a millionaire. I slip inside. The movie's already started. There's that old cinema smell of popcorn, mildew and mass market perfume. It's not a busy time, and the patrons are sparse. Good. I sit in the second to last row, with a clear view of each exit, and think. Ah, oh, this is bad. I've screwed up before. God knows I haven't been a saint. Done things I ain't proud of. Said things to my poor wife that I shouldn't have. But this... This will ruin me. This there is no coming back from. I could pack a bag. Start again. Once the wife finds out my marriage is probably over anyway. She absolutely loved those stupid things. All hand-painted, she told me proudly. At every special edition from the 1944 Rivet Girl to that dumb 68 figure skater. But 1952. That 1952 porcelain figure was special. She came first. I watched her fall down, 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 in the top of the display cabinet to meet her maker on the slick linoleum. It seemed like she fell for days, but I still couldn't save her. Betty grovels on the screen, making eyes at some old rich fellow. They're somewhere snowy. I sink my head into my hands. The wife's probably woken up by now and seen the body parts strewn across the floor. She's going to be wondering where I am. God, what a woman. I don't deserve her. I take a breath and lean back in the chair. The red velvet stained and worn through in places. I need to be a man about this. Maybe I'm scared, but I gotta try and be a man for her. We'll get through this. We have to. I push myself up off the chair, limbs heavy as an old man's, and go home to face the music.
And that is the end of this episode. As usual, we thank you for your time, and we hope you've enjoyed the stories we've brought to you this episode. If you have, please remember to like and share these podcasts and help spread these amazing stories to more people so that we can continue to help emerging writers find their feet. As a closing word, if you're interested in reading more of the stories and poems we've published, or perhaps even want to be involved with the process, as usual, head over to our website at www.banditfiction.com. Thank you once more, and we'll see you again next time.